So it's um, my pleasure to introduce the final speaker, uh, our colleague, Dr. Munther Abu Ramale. Uh, Munther is an assistant professor in the Department of Chemical Engineering, and he uh, has a courtesy appointment in the Department of Genetics. Munther did his undergraduate degree at Jordan University of Science and Technology, where uh, he graduated to the top of the class. He then did his master's degree and PhD at Hebrew University in Jerusalem, where he studied the role of um, OC3 and OC4 transcription factors important for regulating wind signaling and stem cell rate determination. He then uh, came for a postdoctoral fellowship to the Whitehead Institute, where he worked with Dr. David Sabatini. And here he had um, nine papers in cell science and nature. Um, including a major paper in, in science in which he invented a technique to rapidly isolate lysosomes from, from mammals and then use that technique over and over again to profile the, uh, the metabolites that they, they generate and how those uh, are, are used to regulate important processes during starvation and stuff like that. Um, this is an amazing technique that's changing all of our approaches and he, he'll tell us about it. Thank you, Aaron. <laughs> Okay, uh, I hope you guys are still awake. Uh, and thank you for staying until now. Thank you, Tony, for uh, giving me the opportunity to present today. So I will tell two stories uh, using, one of them is really using the same technique, another one using uh, genetic screens. And you can think about my talk as the mirror image of what Henny actually presented. So we look at the, uh, the other way around where we look at kids that develop neurodegeneration. And then we take the genes that were identified to cause that and study their function. Hopefully, we can understand the more common neurodegenerative diseases. So this is the take home message of what we are doing. And we are more interested in the protein function and what the genes are exactly doing. So the, the lab uh, is, is really focusing on uh, metabolism, especially the subcellular metabolism within the compartments. And as you can imagine, uh, these compartments in eukaryotes ev evolved in a way that they will allow different biochemical reactions to proceed because they provide the optimal conditions that are needed. And one of the best examples to study uh, subcellular metabolism is the lysosome. And this is because the lysosome would, uh, would have 60 different hydrolases. These are enzymes that would degrade uh, different types of biomolecules. So you can imagine how dangerous these hydrolases for the cell. And that's why you want to put them in a compartment. In addition to that, there is another layer of protection. These uh, work at optimal pH of uh, 4.5 or 5, which is a very low pH compared to the rest of the cell. In this way, you can guarantee that these enzymes, even if they leak out, they won't have their optimal activity. And the reason why uh, I'm here talking about neurodegeneration and brain is because this metabolism in the lysosome is so key for brain function, as you can see here. So we know that any uh, lysosomal dysfunction, any problem in the process of tra trafficking molecules to the lysosome to be degraded, generating these small molecules or effluxing them through the, lys uh, through the lysosomal transporters would lead to uh, human diseases. And we can categorize them into two different types. On one hand, we have these monogenic diseases which are inherited as biallelic or in a recessive fa fashion. And many of those, almost 70%, uh, would manifest or will have a neurological phenotype. So the, the lysos usually a phenotype of lysosomal storage diseases would be across the whole body, but many of them will also have a, neuro a neurological manifestation. The interest in the lysosome have emerged, though, uh, in the last few years, mainly because we realized that the same lysosomal dysfunction is key for uh, age-associated diseases. So it's correlated with the uh, initiation and progression of many of the age-associated diseases, including AT, PD, and frontotemporal dementia. And just to give you uh, a taste of what's going on in the literature, this is lo uh, a look, a genetic look at the Parkinson disease. So if we were to look at all these genes that are showing up in GWAS studies or even from the exon sequencing of idiopathic uh, patients, uh, or even looking at the familial forms, the inherited forms of Parkinson's disease, and then just look at the genes that are showing up in these studies, many of them are 
localized to the lysosome. They encode lysosomal, core lysosomal proteins or encode genes that would uh, deliver material, will be important for trafficking of material to the lysosome, indicating how important maintaining this endocytic and uh, lysosomal pathway uh, for uh, brain homeostasis. So the, the way we think, as I mentioned earlier, uh, about studying or tackling these questions, what is exactly the lysosomal dysfunction and how the lysosomal dysfunction ends up leading to these severe diseases, what we do is simply taking these monogenic diseases in this case, which uh, caused by, by allelic mutations in lysosomal genes, which are the same genes showing up here, but they are, uh, uh, they are showing up as being uh, variants on one allele only, and then study the function of these genes and try to understand what's going on uh, in the uh, diseased brain. So to, to do this, to define the exact lysosomal dysfunction, as you might imagine, you want to look at the functional output of the lysosome itself. And what better uh, than looking at the uh, molec molecules that are generated in the lysosome? If the function of this lysosome is to degrade macromolecules and uh, produce these small molecules, then if you want to read the function of the lysosome, you have to look at the levels of these small molecules. And this is exactly what we do in the lab. And to do this, as uh, Aaron mentioned, uh, I developed earlier a method that allow us to look at the uh, lysosomal metabolite profile. And it's a very simple approach that is based on simple biochemistry. All what you need is to express uh, some sort of lysosomal membrane protein that has a tag, so a fusion protein, that would allow you, similar to protein purification, to pull down the lysosomes as whole organelles after t expressing this tag in any cell type then homogenize and break open these cells without breaking the organelles, and then come with these anti-HA magnetic beads that would capture the lysosomes specifically, and then you can have very pure and intact fraction of these lysosomes. And this can be done also for other organelles. So now if you think about this in the context of human disease, what we can do that is different from what ha uh, has been done in, in the past is simply to model these diseases in cell, any cell type. And then instead of just looking at the changes in the whole cell, we will look directly at changes in the lysosome and hopefully we can identify pathological pathways within the lysosomal compartment. I think the major decision uh, uh, or the most important decision I've made back then is what kind of diseases to study because I think this would be very important in terms of what kind of discoveries you can make. So a postdoc, who, the first postdoc who joined my lab, Nofloctum, uh, decided to work together with me back then on the CLN3, which is a Batten disease gene. So these are uh, 14 different genes that cause uh, a group of diseases called neuronal ceroid lipofuscinosis. Just from the name, this is a neurodegenerative disease in kids the most common form. Collectively, these are the most common form of neurodegeneration in kids, but are, they are still very rare, of course. And it, it's uh, affecting the neurons. Ceroid is coming from the type of aggregates that you would see in the cells of these kids, and they are uh, autofluorescent aggregates, and that's why it's called lipofuscinosis. So the most common form, as I mentioned earlier, is caused by mutations in CLN3, uh, which is called Batten disease as well, and it's a very aggressive disease. It starts at the age of five, around the age of five, so early on the kid is developing normally, and I think this is really the nasty part of this disease. The kid would have a very normal relationship with the family, and then the vision failure kicks in, most probably because of the accumulation of the aggregates in the optic nerve, and some people think it's in the retina, but then there is this severe decline, mental and uh, motor decline, and patients end up with uh, severe seizures that will end up with early death uh, around the uh, early 20s. So the gene was discovered more than 30 years ago uh, to encode this lysosomal membrane protein CLN3, but the function has been really completely uh, obscure for many, many years. And what we propose, similar to many other people, this might be a transporter of some sort since it's sitting in, on the lysosomal limiting membrane. And we said maybe the lyso-IP method would allow us, the lysosomal immunopurification would allow us together with metabolomics to identify potential substrates that are either accumulating, if it's exporter, 
or uh, uh, depleted from the lysosome if it's imported. So it's as simple as that. And what we did is generating in hec 293 ts very simple cell line, uh, um, a knockout, where you knock out the CLN3 gene, and then which is expressed in all cells. And then what you do, you take the lysosomes and you throw them on the mass spectrometer, which means that you are looking at the ions that are changing between uh, the uh, wild type and the CLN3 knockout lysosomes. And then we found this group of metabolites to be changing. And after spending some time trying to know what these metabolites are, they ended up to be these uh, interesting molecules, the degradation product uh, of phospholipids. So we all know the phospholipids that make the cellular membranes and also the internal membranes in the cell, the different organelles membranes. And these can be either phosphatidyl, glycerol, choline, ethanolamine, serine, depending on the head group. So we have this glycerol backbone, we have two uh, acyl groups, and then the phosphohead group. So what we find accumulating is the degradation product after the deacylation of the lipid we have this glycerophosphohead group, which are polar metabolites that turns out once you recycle the lipids in the lysosome, you need to get them out of the lysosome to be further processed and probably integrated in the lipid biosynthesis, as I will show you as well. And what's interesting, we see the accumulation of all of them. So all of them are actually accumulating inside the lysosome of bat and disease. So we went from really a disease that we have no idea at the molecular level what's going on there to identifying this novel storage material inside the lysosomes. And it's really a storage material because it shoots up from nothing to hundreds of folds in terms of uh, 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 level of or fold change in the knockout. And just to give you an example of this, you can look here at this uh, uh, graph. So this is one of these uh, degradation products. We call them GPDs glycerophosphodiesters, and they can be glycerophosphoglycerol or choline, depending again on the head group. This is one of them, GPG. So if you see here, if you look at the whole cell level in the knockout, you barely see any difference. And this is probably why people missed this over the years, although there were so many studies looking at the, the metabolites in the, the patients as well as in the models. And then in the lysosome, you see this massive accumulation that you can rescue by a simple add back of the CLN3 gene, and this holds true for the five different types of these GPTs. So as I mentioned earlier, this is really a very artificial system. So we, we use HEC293Ts. They have nothing to do with neurons uh, or brain cells, uh, glial cells. So what you can do is uh, to, to use this new model that we developed recently to do lyso-IP in animals. So you can express the lyso tag in any cell type in the mouse because we generated this lock stop, let, uh, lock, stop lock cassette uh, preceding the lysotag uh, fusion gene. And then you can cross them with any cell uh, type Cree or a whole body Cree, like in this case, a constitutive Cree. You can do lyso-IPs, purify lysosomes within really 10 minutes uh, that, that are very, uh, uh, very enriched as well as intact. And then you can do the same studies that we used to do in cells. So you can cross them with the Batten disease model, the CLN3 knockout, do the same metabolomics experiment, and look at the overall change in the metabolite profile. Again, at the brain level here, if you look at the whole brain metabolite profile between the knockout and their siblings, the heterozygous, you don't see any difference, or very little difference. You see massive change if you look in the lysosome, driven mostly by the same exact glycerophosphodiester metabolite. So this is really holding uh, true also in the, uh, uh, in, the, uh, in the brain of the Batten disease model. So I'm not going to go into the details. We've shown that what, what's happening really is the lack of efflux of these glycerophosphodiesters. So if you think about these glycerophosphodiesters, again, they are coming from the deacylation process of these phospholipids that can be uh, done by one enzyme or two enzymes in the subsequent subsequential uh, process where you remove the first acyl group and then you remove the second one. What's important, these are not making it out of the lysosome at this stage. And now we know that these GBDs are indeed a whole mark of Batten disease. So we took patients. Again, there is uh, uh, an urgent need to find biomarkers for Batten disease. And there is no uh, biomarker yet. So what we did, we collaborated with people at the NIH that have a cohort 
uh, although this is a rare disease, but they've collected uh, more than 20 patients. And you clearly see that one of these GPDs, the, the glycerophosphoinositol, can differentiate between uh, the CLN3 patients and patients, uh, pediatric patients of other diseases as well as controls. We also found this to be accumulating even in yeast models and some, uh, uh, and other group uh, found the same thing in models uh, that are used now uh, to, to test gene therapy like pigs, canine, and uh, of course mice similar to us and also individuals. So we are really excited that we started from basic biology, and this is already translating into biomarkers. But I think what's important for us now is to start to understand how you can go from there to disease pathology. And I think this is the more challenging aspect of this uh, study. But we, we think about lysosomal diseases uh, or uh, problems within the lysosomal, lysosomal dysfunction in two ways. One, once you have a dysfunction, accumulation of toxic material can lead to disruption of the lysosomal membrane and probably some sort of leakage and death of the cell. There is a whole pathway called lysosomal mediated cell death. But we also think about it as an extra lysosomal deprivation of important nutrients because if you think about these GPTs, they have choline, they have inositol, they have serine. These are all so key for brain function. They are essential nutrients that probably are not being supplied anymore. And there are examples in the literature, including iron, where the lysosomal dysfunction would lead to l uh, lack of efflux of these important nutrients. So to test these two different models and see if there's any evidence for them in, in the Batten disease cells, what we uh, started with is to look at some sort of lipid uh, uh, or fee product inhibition hypothesis and lipid toxic toxicity. So these are degradation products that might easily inhibit upstream enzymes when they accumulate, right? And maybe this, the accumulation of lipids, which is known to be toxic, then it can lead to some sort of uh, uh, lysosomal dysfunction and damage of lysosomal membranes. So to do so, we took the same lysoIP method in the brain and we adapted to do lipidomics on the lysosomes. And what we find is really very striking result. We see depletion of these interesting lysosomal lipids, which I'm not gonna get into, called BMPs, but we see accumulation of the phospholipids, the ones that are upstream, especially this one here, the species that has only one acyl group. We see a massive accumulation of this GPD inside, uh, uh, sorry, uh, lysophosphatidyl glycerol in the lysosome. We also see lysophosphatidyl choline. And that's very interesting because these are super toxic molecules. These are things you don't want to see in the cell because the, their structure can simply disrupt the lysosomal membrane and other membranes as well. You can buy this as detergent from Sigma to solubilize proteins from membranes. We, we still don't have genetic evidence that this is the toxic material because we need to identify these lipids. And Kwamina in our lab, a biochemistry grad student, now have, uh, has in his hand the two different uh, phospholipases, and we are really excited about doing the experiment where you knock it out and see if you can rescue the phenotype if you don't make these LPGs. But the other uh, arm, as I mentioned earlier, is this extra lysosomal uh, nutrient deprivation. So if GPDs are not making it out, most probably there is lack of supply of important nutrients in the cytoplasm. And to test this, we go back to our expertise, which is in uh, metabolomics. And what you can do is some sort of tracing of the components of the lipids that are being degraded in the lysosome into the overall metabolic network in, inside the cell. So a simple experiment here is taking uh, uh, pups from, uh, uh, from the uh, CLN3 uh, knockout or their siblings, the wild types, and make neurons, and then take these neurons, feed them with the tracer, which in this case we chose to look at choline because it's very important. So we take phosphatidylcholine, where you have deuterium on the uh, choline moiety here. So what you can do actually is after sending it to the lysosome, it's gonna be deacylated. This whole GPC part, the glycerophosphocholine, would make it out in the, uh, from the lysosome and then the choline would go into the lipids, the different lipids in the cell. So we asked the question whether lack of CLN3 would actually lead to decreased contribution from lysosomal choline into the, uh, into the lipids in the neurons. And that's what we exactly see. We first see that 
there is less of the choline itself and the precursor for lipid biosynthesis, the phosphocholine, coming from phosphorylation of choline. And we also see, which is, this is the ultimate test here, we see decreased contribution in these CLN3 knockout neurons of choline coming from this pathway, which is really super interesting because this is one of the first uh, examples showing that the choline, uh, that the lysosome is really supplying nutrients for uh, lipid biosynthesis in the neurons. So, so far, I think with this uh, project, what we, are, we can say that we started from just trying to understand what CLN3 does, and now we, we, we have some evidence that indeed the lysosomal uh, lipid, phospholipid catabolism seem to be a very important pathway in neurodegeneration here. Uh, we still don't have the evidence that CLN3 itself is really the effluxer or a partner of uh, some sort of bigger machinery that efflux these GPTs, but we know that it's required at least. And we have evidence that these pathways, both of them, the product inhibition and lipotoxicity, as well as the extra lysosomal deprivation, uh, are evident, but we, uh, again, we need the genetics now, and now we have in hand the phospholipases that would allow us to test both hypotheses and their contribution to the, the disease phenotype itself. So uh, I just want to, it's not really switching gears, but just get you into the other project here that I'm presenting. So really looking at uh, CLN3 and also some other lysosomal storage diseases, we got so interested in choline metabolism in the brain. And I think it's, when you say choline, you always think about acetylcholine right away anyway, so the, the brain is really connected there. But from genetics itself, it turns out uh, that lysosomal recycling of choline is, is very complicated and it involves multiple different species that contain choline. On one hand, we know that uh, PC here, the phosphatidylcholine, can be degraded as I just showed you uh, by the deacylation step generating this GPC and then CLN3 uh, would be required for this GPC to get out. And if you don't have CLN3, you have a neurodegenerative disease. But also, uh, we know that the sphingomyelin, the other source of uh, choline in the lysosome, and this is very abundant in the brain, as you might imagine, part of the myelination process, would, we have this sphingomyelinase that degrades the sphingomyelin and releases a phosphocholine. This is a more readily available choline form for lipid biosynthesis. Again, if you have a problem in this degradation process, you have Niemann-Bick uh, disease type A which the severe form of which is actually a neurodegenerative disease as well. So we started to think maybe choline metabolism in general in the lysosome is key for the survival of neurons, and it could be that other components of the choline uh, redistribution from the lysosome are also neurodegenerative disease genes. And if you look at this chart here, the missing component is actually the phosphocholine, how it gets out from the lysosome. And it was shown already that phosphocholine is being generated and it should make its way out from the lysosome. And we expected that if we find this transporter, we might find another neurodegenerative disease gene as well. So I'll just uh, remind you that what choline is. Choline is this cationic uh, organic uh, essential molecule that usually we cannot make, although we can synthesize some form of material that would supply choline, as I will uh, show you later. Choline contributes to acetylcholine, which is important in the brain, as you might imagine, but also it can donate methyl group for methylation processes. And I think the most important role of choline here is the uh, structural role in building phosphatidylcholine and sphingomyelin, which are both very important for them in the brain. And where do you get choline from? Mostly food. So we get the choline from food, and then it goes into the bloodstream, and we have multiple uh, or different types of transporters on the cells. The, we have high affinity and low affinity transporter, and as you might imagine, the brain does have uh, high affinity transporters, and, and neurons do as well. But there is one more source of uh, the choline, which is the intracellular source. So the recycling of these phosphatidylcholine and sphingomyelin, as I showed before, are major sources of choline. So to ask this question of how the choline makes it out of the lysosome or the phosphocholine generated from this degradation process, which is the only missing piece in the meantime of that uh, pathway that I showed you, 
we wanted to, to develop a screen to answer this question. And this uh, work was led by uh, Sam and a lot of help from Wen Tao, building on a screening approach that we've developed together with Mike Basic to look only at lysosomal genes. So what we do here, we take the cells, we force them to become dependent on lysosomal pathways of supplying nutrients. And choline is really just one example. We've done this for many other nutrients. And, what, and the way you do it, you simply take a cell line, in this case a cancer cell line of pancreatic or, uh, origin, that actually does a lot of autophagy, uh, autophagy as well as endocytosis or macropenocytosis. You infect those cells with uh, a guide library, a Cas9 library, that targets all the lysosomal genes. And then what you would do, you would let them grow in normal media that has choline. So in this case, they just get choline from the media. So they don't care about the lysosomal supply of choline. Or you remove choline from the media, and now they are forced to get choline only by degrading the lipids in the lysosome. And that's where you can ask them, or ask the system, give me back those genes that would be required to really survive under minus choline conditions. So the genes that are required to degrade and supply the choline from these lipids. That's the whole concept. And this is really uh, uh, was feasible by a lot of work also from Ali Gocciani in the lab who developed this system for other nutrients. So we did this screen, and just to make the long story short, we got uh, this, this plot. And this plot would show you here on the left all the genes that are required for the cells to survive uh, the choline starvation. And as expected, one of, uh, among the highest scoring genes are these ones, LDLR, which is the receptor for the lipid uh, lipoproteins that have the lipids in them coming from outside, which probably the lipids that would have choline. The RAP7, which allowed the endosome to mature into lysosome, so bringing these cholines again from outside, uh, choline containing lipids from outside. Very interesting, this one, which is an enzyme required to convert, uh, to make the uh, phosphatidyl ethanolamine, which the cell can convert into phosphatidyl choline. This is the strongest positive control that the screen is working well. But then we had this highest scoring gene, which is a gene called SBNS1. And this gene is, is, is encoding this orphan, at least at that time, an orphan lysosomal transmembrane protein. So we were super excited. We got the phosphocholine transporter, at least that's what we thought. But again, what's important is to get you back to the first question. I said we expected or predicted that if there is a phosphocholine transporter, it's going to be a neurodegenerative disease gene. But there is no disease actually associated with Spenster 1 yet. But there are models through uh, genetic screens in Drosophila. They found that Spenster mutations are actually causing a neurodegenerative disease like phenotype in Drosophila. They show also the same lipofusin kind of material similar to Batten disease that I showed you earlier. And there is a lot of work also in zebrafish and other models. All of them are showing the same thing. If you knock out or mutate Spenster, you get a neurodegenerative disease phenotype. So we predict it to be in humans, and I'll we'll talk about this more. So the first thing you do is, is actually to take that hit and make sure it's true. So what we do, we knock it out in the cells. And as you see here, wild-type cells would grow normally in minus choline, almost similar to plus choline. But then these cells here with the knockout will be dying or they don't grow. And then you add back the gene, you rescue the phenotype. And this phenotype is actually uh, reproducible in different cell types, which is very, uh, cell lines, which is important. But what's interesting about this phenotype, it's a cell death phenotype. If you, if you remove choline in the absence of Spenster, the cells cannot survive. They initially grow, but then they just die and there is massive death in the plate that you can see it here and you can quantify it here. This is the lethal fraction in the Spencer knockout when they are in minus choline. So it's a death phenotype that you see there. And again, just to remind you with the first slide, our goal was very simple, trying to find the phosphocholine exporter from the lysosome. So we th said this is a Spencer. We have the transporter. However, we, we know how to do lyso-IP, as I showed you before. 
So we took the Spencer knockout cells, we pulled down the lysosome. If you have a transporter of phosphocholine, what would you expect? Simply accumulation of phosphocholine, similar to, the, to these glycerophosphodiesters I mentioned earlier. However, you do this experiment in the knockout, you actually don't see any accumulation of phosphocholine, not any accumulation of choline itself as well. So we, we said, okay, we simply hit a wall here. We, we found something, probably affect the lysosomal function, but it has nothing to do with choline. But we did all the controls. We know it's really specific to choline. But we didn't know what exactly is happening there until Sam did this experiment where she took the, uh, the lysosomes and instead of doing polar metabolite profiling, looking at choline and phosphocholine and all these polar metabolites, she now looked at lipids. And then we see this really striking result, accumulation of lysophosphatidylcholine and lysophosphatidylethanolamine. So just to remind you here, when you degrade the phosphatidylcholine, the most abundant lipid in the cell, we showed before that the major degradation pathway is actually cleaving the two acyl groups. And then you generate the glycerophosphocholine. But it turns out there is another pathway that usually you don't see in normal cells that would only cleave one, that would only cleave one acyl group, leading to the formation of this lysophosphatidylcholine, which is toxic on its own. But it seems like the cell evolved a pathway that would make it in the lysosome and would take it out of the lysosome, maybe through a spinster or spinster-dependent mechanism. Because once you remove spinster, you see this massive accumulation of these LPCs. And the result is really striking. This is just to show you an example of one of these lipid, uh, lysophospholipid species. So you can see accumulation in the lysosome, and you can rescue the phenotype. But now you also see it at the whole cell, because these lysophospholipids should not exist in the cell. So any accumulation in the lysosome would also translate at the whole cell level as well. It's, all, it's true for all the different species we can see. So now the question is whether they're, they are really trapped in the lysosome on the, or this is some kind of accumulation for some weird reason. So the easiest way to do this with tracers, you can take deuterated form, again labeled form of phosphatidylcholine, mix it with BSA and then send it to the lysosome by letting the cells eat it. And then what, look, when you look at here, we send it to the lysosome, there will be cleavage of one acyl group, so these are the lysophospholipids. If spinster exists, then it's very easy for them to get out. If it doesn't exist, we should see them accumulating in the lysosome. And that's exactly what you see. You see the accumulation of the tracer in the lysosome. So this is an active mechanism. There is degradation, and then they need to get out. If you remove spinster, they got trapped there. And the question now, whether spinster is actually a transporter of these lysophospholipids. So these lysophospholipids are formed. It gets them out through. Uh, a transport mechanism that is dependent on spinster. So we used a very simple trick. You can express spinster on the cell instead of on the lysosome by massive overexpression. And then you can just simply do transport assays or uptake assays. You put the lysophospholipids that are deuterated here on the outside, and you monitor if they can go in. Very simple transport assay. You see very nice transport when you express on the membrane this uh, spinster GFP fusion. And if you take one of these concentrations here, we know that this is pH dependent. Because if you are a lysosomal transporter, in most cases, it's a pH dependent transport mechanism. So I want to remind you of the first uh, experiment I showed from the literature. They actually identified a mutant in Spencer that would lead to neurodegenerative disease. So that mutant is at this uh, glutamate here, 217, which is highly conserved across multiple species, and one of them is the human. So you can find the E164. So we expect that if this is transporter and this mutant is affecting the transport mechanism, it should be within a pocket that binds the lysophosphatidylcholine. And this is the case. If you were to do this Schrodinger sliding uh, uh, simulation, you can find that this E164 is very close to a pocket that seems to bind. Uh, the lysophospholipid, and we can mutate the E164, and we can completely uh, ablate the transport ac activity of the spinster uh, protein, really proving again that this is a transporter of lysophospholipid. Mm -hmm. 
So it's, it's, it's really interesting for us because we are identifying this novel salvage pathway of lipids where instead of degrading the lipids completely in the lysosome, the lysosome knows how to only cleave the acyl group, allow them to get out, and then they can be reused again to build new lipids if you don't have enough choline outside. So this is exactly what I'm showing here in this cartoon. In the, de novo, in the normal situation, choline is abundant. It can get in. You can, in the ER, synthesize lipids from the choline through uh, the Kennedy pathway. But here, if you have less choline outside, then this pathway becomes really important where lipids get uh, degraded in the lysosome, not completely, but partially to lysophosphatidylcholine. And then these can make it out. And by one enzyme, one step mechanism, you can make phosphatidylcholine, the most important lipid in the membranes. So a novel salvage pathway. I didn't show you that, though, that this is happening, that you are really using these to build new lipids. And this is a very easy experiment for us because all what you need to do is to take these deuterated PC, send them to the lysosome again. And in this case, the, you monitor the formation of new phospholipids. And we can clearly see that this is the case. There is really depletion of the contribution of the, uh, the lysophosphatidylcholine to newly generated phosphatidylcholine in the cell if you knock out spinster. So this is, uh, this is very interesting to see because it really proves that the lysophosphatidylcholine is contributing to making new lipids. With that, I would like to thank the team, uh, the collaborators, as well as the funding, uh, and thank you very much for staying late today. A uh, very interesting talk. I was wondering your first part, the CLNP3 story, how it expressed in different cell types in the brain, glia versus neurons, and do they have um, similar fun it, did they have similar function in different cell types? If so, why this deficient lead to the neuron death but not the other cells? Thanks. Yeah, that's a great question. We know it's higher in glia and, uh, in oligodendrocyte uh, sites and microglia. Uh, but slightly higher, so it's, it's really expressed in all cells. And we think it's the biochemical function, so most, most probably it's the same function, but probably the, uh, the result of that function is different in different cell types. What I can say is that the supply of choline through this pathway, at least in our hands, is happening only in neurons. When we tested other cell types, it didn't show. Uh, so this, the accumulation is happening, but the lack of the uh, or the, the contribution of choline to lipid making is happening only in the neurons. So maybe that would explain some of it, but it could be other reasons. Maybe neurons are more, toxi uh, are more sensitive to uh, toxicity by the lysophospholipids that accumulate there. Um, yeah, super cool talk. Um, about the second part, can you remind me again, like, why do you think the lysosome actually produces um, LPC from PC and creates this super dangerous, some sort of like molecule in between to use it up. And, and what do you think the fatty acid that's cleaved off, where, where do you think this is going? Yeah, I, I think you got exactly the take home message of this right. talk, which is really why we are making those. Uh, we were really surprised when we saw the result. Yeah. I mean, I had no idea why you would risk yourself putting LPCs there, because as we said, they are super toxic. But seems like we evolved a whole system to do this, so there must be a reason. I think that there might be a high demand of making new phosphatidylcholine, and you need to make it quickly. So we, we are testing this now. We got the mouse model very recently, and I think these are really at the top of the questions that we are trying to, add, to have answer. You, have you also tried in that regard to tag or deteriorate the, the fatty acids that sit at the PC and see if they end up somewhere specific? Because maybe they they need that more than the, than the LPC or the PC itself. Yeah, that's a great thought. We didn't, but we can do that for sure. That's a great point. Thank you for your presentation. I have read some literature um, that, that literally recommends or discusses the possibility of taking phosphatidylcholine orally as, far, as a supplement. I wonder if you could comment on that, whether you think that's efficacious. Choline, probably, what you mean. Not phosphatidylcholine, but choline itself. Yeah, yeah. 
I, I'm not. I'm not sure that there is enough really uh, scientific evidence, at least in the brain, for why you want to take it. But I think among the new things that are emerging, which I can say, it's like one thing that choline does. It would rescue the accumulation of lipid droplets in some cases because if you have, it's it's just a competition between two pathways. One would build phosphatidylcholine, and the other one would build triglycerides and triglycerides will accumulate in these lipid droplets. So work from uh, uh, Sue Lindquist lab, uh, or a postdoc that who used to be in Sue Lindquist lab showed that in the case of APOE, for example, there is uh, a preferred pathway that would take the, the fatty acids into triglyceride and store them in lipid droplets. If you were to add choline, you can skew this towards like making phosphatidylcholine more. But this is all really, uh, new evidence that I don't know how it relates to, to, to the need or the su supply of choline using supplements. I don't think there is much. Maybe the doctors in the room, the physicians can tell us more, but I'm not really sure. One last question, maybe? Anybody? Okay, if not, I would like to thank everybody again, the speakers. Um, Speci specific thanks also again to Natasha uh, for uh, getting this off. We had last minute um, uh, problems with uh, AV and things like that. Um, Jill uh, Wenzel and her team with Ali, also the fellows uh, from my lab and students who helped uh, running uh, the show. Um, thank you again so much. Uh, besides exercise, uh, one of the best predictors of long life is social interaction. So I urge you to stay and uh, exchange a few words uh, at the social. Uh, thank you so much.